Hey Optimancers, Chris here. For the next several weeks, I want to start talking about clerics. Uh, now, on my Monday videos, I'm going to start talking about clerics. I may occasionally include some other videos as well, uh, but what I want to do is create a comprehensive cleric guide. I'm going to create a playlist, you're going to see it called Treat Monk's Guide to Clerics, and it is going to contain all the content I do for clerics. Now, if we look at clerics, just like any other class, if we look at the class guides that are available online, they do not give you very much detail, including class guides on YouTube. Uh, and I just read a cleric guide this morning uh, where we had one race and they talked about how dex wasn't very useful for clerics. And then they had another race that had a dex bonus and suddenly dex is a good thing. Uh, so there's not even consistency within their own class guides, never mind from guide to guide. Uh, so what I want to do is create the most comprehensive cleric class guide that there is. Uh, and this will go alongside my current wizard guide, uh, and then I may get into more guides later, but cleric is what I'm going to be doing now. So for today's video, what I want to do is I want to touch on some of the misconceptions about clerics. I want to talk about some of the stereotypes about clerics that are bang on. And then I want to talk about what are my favorite races for clerics and why they are my favorites. So let's get going. So if we talk about clerics, the first thing I want to talk about are the misconceptions about clerics because people have some very strong misconceptions about clerics. Uh, the first one and the most obvious one is that clerics make fantastic healers. I will say that clerics make decent healers. And if you make a cleric, you should expect healing to be some of what you do. Uh, but number one, clerics are probably not doing healing all the time. Uh, and number two, they're not your best class for healing. If you want to look at your best class for healing, I would look at the Druid. And if you want to be absolutely outstanding at healing, I'd look at a Circle of Dreams Druid. Uh, but if you are looking at a Cleric, you will be able to heal. You'll be able to heal okay, but you just can't heal enough that it is going to be a worthy thing for you to be doing all the time. Uh, so that's the first misconception, is that this is what clerics do, they're healers. Uh, clerics can heal, but that is not their primary purpose. The second misconception I see with clerics all the time is that we have a bunch of different subclasses, some of them give you medium armor, some of them give you heavy armor, and that the medium armor clerics are worse on defense. Intuitively, of course, you would think that wearing lighter armor would make you worse on defense. Uh, but actually, all it really does is it changes how we adjust our ability scores. Uh, because if we look at even our starting armor, if we start with medium armor, we start with scale mail. If we start with heavy armor, we start with chain mail. As long as we have a 14 dexterity, then we will have the same armor class regardless. This holds until we get to the absolute best armors for each uh, armor type. Uh, and then we will get to the point where we have plate mail and half plate. And plate mail has a one higher armor class than half plate does. So the difference even at the end game is pretty minuscule. But what will happen is, is if you are wearing heavy armor, you're going to need a decent strength because heavy armor has a minimum strength requirement. If you fail to meet that, you take a 10 foot movement penalty, which is something you probably don't want to do. Uh, and if you are wearing medium armor, you will be able to add your dexterity bonus up to a maximum of plus two. That means you're probably going to want a 14 dexterity. So if we are making a character with medium armor, we're probably going for wisdom and dexterity. And if we're making a character with heavy armor, we're probably going for wisdom and strength. And that's really the only difference. Uh, and then the final misconception I hear all the time is that and this goes with the first one, is that clerics are healers and they're spellcasters. They're certainly not damage dealers. And that is completely backwards. Clerics are better at dealing damage than they are doing anything else, including healing. Clerics can be expecting to do damage that is within line with the best damage dealers in the game. Uh, and this begins at low level and it will carry on to high level. So if doing damage is something you want to do, Cleric is a good choice for you. 
Now let's talk about some stereotypes that are true. The first one is that clerics are good against undead and clerics are fantastic against undead. Every single cleric gets the turn undead ability starting at level two. And it is just an amazing ability when you come across undead. The main problem with it, of course, is that if you don't come across undead, you can't use it. But if you do come across undead, it's fantastic. It comes on early and it remains effective even against more powerful undead. So against undead, yes, clerics are terrific. The second thing you hear is that clerics are the best class for raising the dead. Uh, specifically, like when your companions die, you can bring them back to life. And yes, clerics are the best class for that. They're not the only class that can do it, but if we want to do it, clerics are the best at it. And the third thing you're gonna hear is that clerics are good at aiding allies. And that is absolutely true. Clerics have a lot of spells. They even have some class abilities uh, and subclass abilities that are specifically geared to aid allies and they do it effectively. Uh, so yes, clerics are good at doing damage. They're good at aiding allies. We can expect to do a little bit of healing. And if somebody does happen to die, we can expect to be able to be the one who is able to bring them back. And that's what clerics are. So now what I wanna do is I wanna shift gears and I wanna talk about the races. So what I wanna list here are the races that I consider the best races for cleric. Now there are a lot of races in D&D that make decent clerics. Uh, and a lot of them are not gonna be listed here. What I wanna do here is I wanna list what I would consider my favorite race if I was going to play in Eberron, what race I would consider my favorite race for cleric if I was going to play in Ravnica, and then I'm gonna talk about my top 10 races that I would choose for Forgotten Realms. And I'm gonna tell you why I think each of these races are good, and I'm going to tell you what kind of clerics are gonna be the best kind of clerics for those races. Now, every race I'm gonna list is gonna have a bonus to wisdom. Uh, if I am playing a cleric and I'm choosing a race, a bonus to wisdom is very important. And when I talked about wizards, I said, it's important, but we can get around it because a lot of spells don't require intelligence. When I talked about ranger spells, I said that a lot of rangers don't necessarily need to have a good wisdom because they have a lot of spells that don't rely on their wisdom. Clerics aren't like that. If you want to play a cleric and you want to be effective, you really want that plus one bonus to wisdom. Their most important spells are going to rely on it. So if we are playing a cleric and I'm choosing a race, number one, it needs to have a bonus to wisdom. So all the races here I list will have a bonus to wisdom. There are other races I won't list that could have a bonus to wisdom that are still decent races. These are just my favorites. So as I talk about these races, I'm going to be using a color coding system. Uh, if you are a fan of this channel, you already know how this works. But generally speaking, uh, I will use the colors red, orange, purple, green, and blue to describe various things to uh, just put a visual representation of how good I think it is. Uh, with these races, nothing's going to be red or orange because these are what I consider to be the best races. So I'm going to be ranking things purple if I think they're a decent choice, green if I think they're a really good choice, and blue if I think they are a perfect choice. Now, if you are colorblind, you'll find that I'll put asterisks underneath the uh, race name so that you can still tell what ranking I gave it. Uh, it'd be three stars for purple, four stars for green, and five stars for blue. And if you are further sight impaired, I will announce what color I am making each of these selections. So if we're talking about Eberron, of course, we're gonna have access to many of the races that I'm going to list otherwise here. Uh, but one race that stands out that is not available elsewhere is the Warforged. Warforged make excellent clerics. Uh, their ability scores include a bonus to constitution of plus two, and they can choose throughout their ability score bonus. So of course you're gonna choose wisdom, and that leads to an ideal mix of ability scores. A bonus to constitution and a bonus to wisdom is pretty much the best combination you can have. And the reason for that is because wisdom is your most important ability score, but constitution is your second most important. And that is because your concentration saves are gonna be based on your constitution, as well as other constitution saving throws, as well as your hit points. So constitution's really important. And I would say after wisdom and constitution, then dexterity or strength is important. Uh, but those two are the most important. Warforge can get them both. The next thing you're gonna get with a Warforge that is gonna be really helpful to you is integrated protection. 
Uh, and essentially, this is where the Warforged can absorb the armor and then gains the armor class of the armor plus one. Uh, this means that we can expect a Warforged to have one greater armor class than other clerics. Finally, Warforged are getting constructed resilience. This is going to give them advantage on saving throws versus being poisoned, resistance to poison damage, they don't need to eat, drink, or breathe, they're immune to disease. Uh, all these things uh, are all pretty useful. They're all circumstantial, but you put them all together, they're all just nice to haves. You put them on top of the integrated protection, you put them on top of the perfect ability scores, uh, and then we're also gonna get one additional skill proficiency, one additional tool proficiency, so the Warforged, all together, I would give it a green ranking. Very good choice. Now, if you are playing in Ravnica, uh, you have a number of different racial choices. And a few of them, I think, are reasonably good for uh, clerics. The Simic Hybrid is pretty good. The Loxodon is pretty good. I actually think the best race in the Ravnica campaign setting for a cleric is the Centaur. Uh, and the main reason for that is they have a speed of 40 feet and that's going to be useful for you. With a cleric, whether you are a melee cleric or not, you can expect to be in the melee range uh, because a lot of the spells you do that deal damage require you to be in relatively close. Uh, and having that extra maneuverability will be very handy for you. You're gonna get a plus one bonus to wisdom and a plus two bonus to strength. This is going to work well with heavy armor. Now, there's not a lot of rules uh, regarding armoring a centaur, uh, but assumably a centaur can wear heavy armor, and I would definitely go for a heavy armor subclass with a centaur. And then we're going to get an extra skill from a pretty good list. So uh, with a centaur, I would recommend a melee cleric with heavy armor and take advantage of that 40-foot speed to move you in to melee and be effective. So overall, I think the Centaur is a decent choice, one I would give a purple ranking to. And that brings us to the Forgotten Realms. So I'm going to give you my top 10 Forgotten Realms races. Uh, and I'm going to start at number 10, work my way to number one. Uh, number 10 is still gonna be purple because there are a ton of races that I'm not gonna be talking about. Some of them even make half decent clerics. Half Elf, for example, makes an okay cleric. Um, but you will not find it on this list because I don't think it's in the top 10. This is the top 10. First, the Kenku. The Kenku are going to bring on a plus one bonus to wisdom and a plus two bonus to dexterity. I am not going to tell you that dexterity is useless for clerics. Dexterity is useful for clerics if they are medium armor clerics. So with a Kenku, it is not important if you pick a subclass with a heavy armor proficiency because you're going to want to wear medium armor. With the Kenku also, we're going to get two additional skill proficiencies, and the skill list we get to choose from is pretty good. Uh, some very nice skills on there. And then things like Mimicry and Forgery, I think it would work well with something like a Trickery Cleric. Uh, and that would probably be my first suggestion, if you're playing a Kenku, is to consider maybe the Trickery Domain. So overall, I think the Kenku is a pretty strong choice for Cleric, and I would give it a purple ranking. Uh, the next race I want to talk about is the Furbolg. The Furbolg is almost a giant. Uh, they are still medium sized, but they are very large. And stereotypically, a Furbolg is going to be a druid. But Furbolgs actually make pretty good clerics. They're going to get a plus one bonus to wisdom and a plus two bonus to strength. And you know what I'm going to say? That means that this is a pretty good mix if you want to make a cleric that's going to wear heavy armor. So I would only choose a subclass where heavy armor proficiency is included with a fur bulk. Also, if we're going to have a good strength, this is where I would consider playing a melee cleric uh, and use weapons. Also, if we're going to have the bonus to strength, this is probably the point where I would be looking at the possibility of playing a melee cleric and use a melee weapon. Uh, also, for bulks get some just some nice little racial abilities. They get for bulk magic. It's going to give them detect magic and disguise self, which is a first level spell that we normally wouldn't have access to. That's going to be relatively useful for us. Uh, and then hidden step as a bonus action, you can turn invisible. This, of course, uh, thematically is more for use in terms of uh, evading enemies and uh, staying hidden. But we might even just use this as a bonus action to set up an advantage attack with a big weapon. And finally, we're going to get Speech of Beast and Leaf. 
allows us to speak to plants, allows us to speak to animals, allows us to do all that with advantage. Uh, if we want to do that with spells, that's actually pretty hard to do. Uh, so to get all that as a racial ability, although it's circumstantial, is still pretty good. So Furball comes in at number nine on my list, and I would give it a purple ranking. The eighth race uh, I am going to recommend is the Water Genasi. The Water Genasi, again, has that perfect mix of ability scores. We're going to get the plus two bonus to Constitution and a plus one bonus to Wisdom. Uh, other than the perfect list of ability scores, we're getting some minor stuff. Uh, we're going to have resistance to acid damage. You don't get targeted with a lot of acid damage, uh, but resistance to it is also reasonably rare. Uh, you can breathe air and water. Always useful. Uh, and we're going to get an additional cantrip and additional spell. We're going to get the shape water cantrip, uh, which is a moderately useful cantrip. It is primarily a utility spell, uh, but an okay utility spell. And create or destroy water, which is, in my opinion, not a fantastic spell. But if I get it for free, I'm definitely going to take it. It's circumstantial, but in the right circumstances, it can be very useful. Uh, so we're going to get some extra spells. We're going to get the breathe water. We're going to get an occasionally useful damage resistance and the perfect ability score mix. Overall, makes the water genasi a very good choice, and I would rank them purple. That brings us into my seventh selection, and that is the Lizard Folk. I think Lizard Folk make amazing clerics. Their ability scores, once again, we have the ideal mix, the bonus of Constitution plus two, Wisdom plus one. We are also going to get two additional skills, and the skill list we have to choose from is amazing. Perception, Survival, Stealth, all on this list. Great list. Uh, then we're going to get the ability to hold our breath for 15 minutes. Now, that's not as good as Breathe Water, but in most cases, it's going to be effectively as good as Breathe Water. Uh, only if we're going to need to hold our breath for a very long time is the 15 minutes not going to suffice. And then we're going to get an ability called Hungry Jaws. And what that does is when you're in battle, uh, you can use a bonus action to make a bite attack. Now, you can only do this once per rest. Uh, and the obvious thing to think about with the Cleric, if you've played a lot of Clerics, you know that there's kind of a list of things that are standard for pretty much any kind of Cleric in battle. Uh, and that really starts around level 5. And what happens on round 1 is we're going to cast a spell and we're going to cast Spirit Guardians. And then on round 2, we're going to cast Spiritual Weapon with our bonus action, leaving us our regular action to do something else. And this sets up our offensive strategy. So when you look at an ability like Hungry Jaws, the first thing that might come to mind is that it's going to interfere with Spiritual Weapon, because Spiritual Weapon is going to be using up our bonus action every round. But Spiritual Weapon will not be using up our bonus action every round. It'll be using up our bonus action every round starting on round two. So Hungry Jaws actually makes a great addition to round one, because when we cast Spirit Guardians, we can't cast Spiritual Weapon uh, because of spellcasting restrictions. But we could use our bonus action for something else. So Hungry Jaws is a great choice for us uh, on round one with a Cleric. Not that our Jaws do a lot of damage, but with Clerics, that tends to be the case. We tend to have usually damage coming from multiple sources, and none of them do great damage on their own. But you add all of them together, and then they do excellent damage. So in addition to having the perfect ability scores, in addition to having two great bonus skills, we're also going to have this occasional boost to our offense, which is just lovely to have with a class that focuses on offense. So the Lizard Folk, I think, make a great race for clerics, and I would rank them green. That brings us to my sixth favorite race for clerics, uh, and this one, uh, the ability scores aren't perfect, and that is the Protector Azamar. Now with the Protector Azamar, we are gonna get our bonus to wisdom, which is important, but our second ability score is in Charisma, which is not ideal. Now, I will say that that doesn't mean that a Charisma bonus is useless. When we get further into this series, I'm going to talk a little bit about multi-classing options with clerics, and we'll find ways that Charisma can actually be fairly useful to have. But the reason I really like the Protector Asmar as a race for clerics is it has a ton of racial abilities that are quite good. So the first thing, we're going to get Dark Vision. Uh, that's pretty common, 
but it's nice to have. Uh, second thing we're going to have is we're going to get resistance to necrotic and radiant damage. And that's really nice because uh, usually when a race gets a resistance to a certain type of damage, they get a resistance to one type of damage. We're going to get a resistance to two types of damage. Now, I wouldn't expect to take a lot of radiant damage in most campaigns, uh, but necrotic damage is definitely going to come up and you will have resistance to it. Very nice to have. The next ability is a little bit counterintuitive uh, to a cleric, and that's Healing Hands, uh, because Healing Hands allows you to do your action and do a little bit of healing. And you would immediately think that's potentially redundant, because if we are going to have Cure Wounds, for example, it's basically doing the same thing. Uh, so what's the use of Healing Hands? But the use of Healing Hands is not just that it doesn't require the spell slot, but also that it doesn't require spell casting. That means we can use healing hands in the same round that we're casting a spiritual weapon. And that gives it a lot more utility, it means that we're going to be able to perform the healing when we need to, even if otherwise it would be inconvenient. And the use of our action is no problem. We hear about healing word being the superior option for healing all the time. I'm not convinced healing word is the superior option for clerics because clerics are often concentrating on something else. They're using their bonus action for something else. And the thing that is most available to them is their action, which actually often makes cure wounds the better selection. The only real advantage of healing word is the range. Uh, so healing hands also has that advantage that using the action for healing when we are a cleric is potentially better than it being a bonus action. Asimars will also get the light cantrip, so we're getting a free cantrip. And then when we reach level three, we are going to get the primary reason why I recommend the Protector Asimar, that's the Radiant Soul ability. Uh, the Radiant Soul ability, again, takes an action to set up. Once again, it can be used on the same round we use our spiritual weapon spell, uh, because the only other thing we're gonna do with our action is maybe do a minor weapon attack or a minor cantrip damage. So setting this up is a lower cost than it is if we're playing a different class. Uh, and when we do so, uh, we're going to get concentration free flight. And of course, concentration free flight is fantastic. Uh, we're also going to be able to deal additional radiant damage on our turn, as long as we do additional damage from any source on our turn. And because we're a cleric and we're doing damage from multiple sources, we're going to have multiple chances to do damage on our turn with a cleric. So we can pretty much be relying on that extra damage every time we take a turn. So the Protector Asimar's racial abilities really fit nicely with cleric. And there's so many of them. And they're good abilities. So you put all those together. And I think despite the fact that the Protector Asimar doesn't have the perfect ability scores for a cleric, I do think they make amazing clerics. And I would give them a green ranking. So this brings us to number five on my list. And number five on my list is a personal favorite for me, the Ghostwise Halfling. I love playing a Halfling, uh, but Ghostwise Halflings make amazing clerics. First off, with their ability scores, we're going to get a plus one bonus to Wisdom and a plus two bonus to Dexterity. This can be a great mix for clerics as long as we are wearing medium armor. So with a Ghostwise Halfling, Medium armor is the way you want to go. So if you're looking at a subclass that gives you heavy armor proficiency, just be aware that's not a bonus for you at all. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take that subclass, but even if you do take that subclass, you don't want to wear the heavy armor. Now, the reason I love the Ghostwise Halfling is for the racial abilities. Uh, number one, Ghostwise Halflings have a permanent telepathy. Doesn't use a spell. They can just have telepathic communication with anyone within 30 feet using their action anytime they want. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about halflings in general is halfling nimbleness. Halflings can move through enemy squares of a medium or larger sized creature, which gives them improved maneuverability on the battlefield. When you are setting up something like a spirit guardians, that can be an advantage for allowing you to get more enemies in the radius than would otherwise normally be possible, thus improving your offense. And offense, again, is the primary purpose of a cleric. And finally, last, but definitely, definitely not least, is the halfling luck ability. I have talked about this many times before, but when you are playing a halfling, anytime you roll a d20 and you roll a one, 
you get a chance for a reroll. This will happen. Most days when I play Halfling and I go to play, I will use Halfling Luck at least once. Things like Halfling Luck just mean that Halflings are going to be better at hitting with their weapons than other races. They're going to be better at making concentration saves than other races. They're going to be better at making every single saving throw than other races. Halfling Luck gets into everything and just makes everything a little bit better. And just as a player, I'll say that nothing is more frustrating than a natural one. But nothing is more exhilarating than getting that natural one and realizing that you get to reroll it. So the Ghostwise Halfling, and I might be a little biased here. I've been very open with the fact that Halflings are my favorite race. Uh, but I do think that Ghostwise Halfling makes an excellent cleric. And I would give them a green ranking. So that brings us into our top four races. And ranked at number four, I put the Aarakocra. Now... You may be very well in a campaign where Aarakocra are banned. And if you don't know if they're banned, I would definitely talk to my DM before I bother making an Aarakocra. Because what Aarakocra get, and the reason why they tend to make good pretty much everything, is that they have a permanent concentration-free flight. And that is a huge advantage to have in Dungeons & Dragons. And it does work very well with clerics as well. Now, their flight ability only works if they're wearing light armor, but that's okay. You can wear light armor with an Aarakocra. You're going to have a bonus to dexterity and a bonus to wisdom. So wisdom, of course, is what we want. Dexterity is good if we're going to not wear heavy armor. And with an Aarakocra, I would definitely bump up that dexterity and then wear studded leather. And I would still wear a shield because the flight does not restrict you from using a shield. So if you have a good dexterity and studded leather and a shield, you're still going to have a good armor class. But it's all about the concentration-free flight here that, as a permanent ability, outperforms every other racial ability in the game. And again, check with your DM to see if they're even allowed. Personally, I don't allow Aarakocra. And that's why, overall, I would say the Aarakocra are a blue rating. So that brings us into our top three. Our, what are our best three races for Cleric? And I think for number three is the Wood Elf. The Wood Elf gets a plus one bonus to Wisdom, plus two bonus to Dexterity. You know what that means. It means that a Wood Elf is going to work best if we make a medium armor cleric. Now, Wood Elves have a movement speed of 35. Obviously, additional maneuverability is really useful. Now, one of the things I hear that's great about Dwarves, and I agree, is that a Dwarf can wear heavy armor without a strength requirement. They can ignore the strength requirement of heavy armor. So that means even a low strength dwarf can wear heavy armor without any modification to their movement speed. And that is a lovely racial ability to have. But here's what I don't hear talked about. Wood Elf has a base movement speed of 35. Dwarf has a base movement speed of 25. Wood Elves don't have the ability to wear heavy armor and ignore the strength requirement. So I throw full plate on my Wood Elf with an 8 strength and their speed goes down to 25. That's the same as a dwarf. So that's how good the additional movement speed is. It's better than the dwarven ability because if I'm wearing medium armor, I can still go 35. And if I'm wearing heavy armor, I can go just as fast as a dwarf. All elves get a bonus proficiency to perception. Perception is the best skill in the game. It is not a class skill for clerics, so being able to get it is very important. Wood Elves also get proficiency in Long Sword, Short Sword, Short Bow, and Long Bow. Now, if I am playing a melee cleric, ideally, I will have proficiency in Martial Weapons, and then what I want to use is a Rapier. Uh, but if I don't have proficiency in Martial Weapons, and I do want to do melee, normally I'd be stuck with a Dagger if I want the Finesse property. Short Sword is an improvement from that. If we are playing a character that, for some reason, is going to have a good Strength score, uh, then Longsword is a good addition there. Uh, but that would be pretty odd because we're getting the bonus to Dexterity. We're not getting the bonus to Strength. I would probably be looking most of the time at a Dexterity-based Wood Elf. Uh, and then the access to the Longbow is okay. It's actually not much better than the Light Crossbow. Uh, we don't have the loading property, but the loading property in most cases isn't causing us a lot of problems. Uh, only case I could really see it is maybe if we're playing something like a War Cleric and we have the ability to make that extra attack on our turn, if we're using a Longbow, then we're not going to have that loading property in the way. Then, of course, we have Dark Vision and we have Mask of the Wild. Dark Vision, of course, 
very common ability, but still good to have. Mask of the Wild just gives you some bonuses on stealth in lightly obscured areas. If it's naturally lightly obscured, uh, that's going to be pretty circumstantial, I think, for most cleric builds. But overall, the Wood Elf brings a lot of things to the table, and they really do make fantastic clerics, and I would give them a blue ranking. That brings us to what I think is the second best race for clerics, and that is the Variant Human. The Variant Human, of course, has flexible ability scores. That means we can simply put our bonuses in our Wisdom and our Constitution, which is probably where we want to put them. We're going to get an extra skill proficiency, and we're probably going to want to put that in Perception. And the reason why the Variant Human is so good is the bonus feat. And I would imagine with most cleric builds, if we're using the Variant Human, most of the time I'd be looking at the Warcaster feat. The Warcaster feat is perfect for clerics uh, because the Warcaster feat includes three different features. And most characters who take it are usually only taking it for one of those features. And that is the ability to make concentration saves with advantage, which is of course exceptional. With a cleric, we can expect to be in melee range most of the time. That means we're probably going to be making more opportunity attacks than other classes do. And also, the ability to cast with our hands full really works well for clerics because clerics have a shield proficiency. They're probably going to be wearing a shield. And if you want to use a weapon as well, then spells that have a somatic component but no material component are difficult to cast. Uh, it involves having to make sure that you get rid of your weapon so that you can cast then pick up your weapon again. Uh, but with the Warcaster feat, we'll be able to cast those spells without any problem. So that's a huge bonus to have with a cleric and being able to access all of that at level one is massive. So although there's not a lot of racial features for a Varian human, that bonus feat is so, so good. It means that the Varian human is going to get to a 20 wisdom faster than any other race because those other races are going to want to take a feat that's going to boost their concentration saves but the variant human already has it so that means that their primary ability score is probably going to be higher until we get past level 12. that's a huge advantage for the variant human and the reason why i consider them the second best race for clerics and i give them a blue ranking so that brings us to what I consider to be the most powerful race for clerics, and that is the Hill Dwarf. With the Hill Dwarf, number one, the ability scores are ideal. We're getting the plus two bonus to constitution, plus one bonus to wisdom, couldn't be better. Next, we're going to get dark vision. Lots of races get dark vision, but as always, it's still a good ability to have. Then we're gonna get Dwarven Resilience. It's gonna give us resistance to poison damage and advantage on poison saving throws. And if you play D&D, I will tell you that you can expect to be targeted with poison damage fairly regularly. Of all the various damage types, it is definitely one of the most common to target PCs. So having that resistance is super helpful. Now, if you want to play a melee cleric, but you wanted to choose a subclass that wasn't going to get martial weapon proficiency, a Hill Dwarf has you covered because they are going to get proficiency in Battle Axe, Hand Axe, Light Hammer, and War Hammer. And you would want to use either a Battle Axe or a War Hammer. And that would be in conjunction with a Shield, which is generally your best choices with the Cleric. Now, I mentioned this with the Wood Elf, but the Hill Dwarf has the ability to wear heavy armor without meeting the Strength requirement with no movement penalty. That means we could potentially play an 8 Strength Hill Dwarf Cleric, put on heavy armor, and it doesn't slow us down at all. Uh, and that is a very useful thing to have, and it opens up something that isn't open for most cleric builds, and that is, as I kind of mentioned before, with cleric builds, we definitely want to have a great wisdom score, and we definitely want to have a great constitution score, but in addition to that, we probably want to have either a good dexterity score or a good strength score uh, for use with armor. But with a hill dwarf, we have the option of not having a great dexterity or a great strength without giving up anything in terms of defense. That means we can focus even more on our wisdom and constitution. So very likely that a hill dwarf cleric could walk into combat at level one with a 16 wisdom and a 16 constitution. That's going to give them hit points in line with martial classes. Never mind the fact that with their armor, they're probably going to have as good or better an armor class. And that just means that defensively, 
Hill Dwarf is fantastic. And don't forget that that higher constitution also means better constitution saving throws, including concentration saving throws. And finally, a Hill Dwarf is going to get an additional hit point per level. Add that to the fact that a Hill Dwarf is probably going to have probably a plus one additional bonus to their constitution over other clerics. That's probably going to mean, on average, I would say, an additional plus two hit points per level. This means that your Hill Dwarf cleric may have more hit points than the martial classes in your campaign, in addition to having a better armor class than those characters. So if we're going into melee, we can potentially take more attacks than any of our allies. Put all those things together, I think the Hill Dwarf makes an amazing cleric. And I think the best of all the choices amongst the official races. So I would rank the Hill Dwarf blue, and it is my number one pick. So that is the races for Dungeon Dragons for Cleric. And I hope I've given you some idea on how ability scores are going to fit for clerics and how armor relates to ability scores in regards to clerics. Because that is going to be important as we talk about subclasses next week. So next week we're going to go through all the subclasses for clerics. We're going to rank them for you. We're going to go through the abilities in detail uh, so that we can really understand how to best build a cleric for each subclass there is. So I hope you'll join me next week. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers. See you next week. Mm -hmm.